that shit. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Now my face behind my back and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. <laughs> Brought to you live and unfiltered punk. from all four corners of the globe That's what you said. by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelchay, and today I have two very special guests with me in Phuket, Thailand, legendary striking coach Roberto Flamingo and UFC lightweight contender Peter Holman. Roberto, Peter, how you guys doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. And, uh... And you? I'm doing good, man. I can't complain. It's uh, it's the middle of the week. Uh, we get past Monday. If you can survive Monday, everything else after that's gold, right? Yeah, so is that. So, is that. so you guys are currently training uh, at Tiger Muay Thai. I uh, imagine that this is for Peter's upcoming fight on June 20th in Berlin. Yes, UFC exactly. fight night. What number is that? 2,020 million? They've got so many. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, crazy? I don't know. I don't know. I was just telling, uh, I was just telling a friend, I was looking at the at the calendar, and there's a UFC event every single weekend till like the almost, end of the year. Yeah, yeah. yeah almost, It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, so many fights. And it's it's just a few short years ago that I think a lot of us were like complaining. We're like, oh, it's, it's such a long wait, you know, between events. And now it's like, you gotta like you can't have a life outside of just your work during the week and then watching fights on the weekend. Yeah. Are yeah. you guys big fans of watching the events live? Yeah, yeah. me. Uh, especially when, especially when there are good fights, I, al- I always watch. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because of uh, Piotr also, then I watch the, the, the lightweight to see what what they are doing because yep. you never know who you're gonna face and uh, yeah, it can be a, a top ten guy or a top fifteen or whatever. So uh, I watch a lot, a lot of fights. Yeah, the lightweight division in the UFC is uh, it's a shark tank. Yeah, here and there. Who are who are some of the guys that that impress you, Peter, in the lightweight division? I don't know. Last fight, the title fight was, was really good. That so was pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah, Did, were, you, were you expecting Rafael dos Anjos to put on that type of dominant performance against a stud like uh, like Anthony Pettis? Yeah. Maybe not expecting, but I knew it could go that way he's, he, because uh, he's very good, Rafael. Yeah. All right, so we got tons of things to talk about. Roberto, you're a legendary striking coach. You've worked with the likes of, I mean, so many guys. Rashad Evans, Vitor Belfort, Thiago Silva, CR, Eddie Alvarez, Fedor Emelianenko, Anthony Johnson. What an incredible legacy you have there. Tell us a little bit how you, how you became uh, you know, involved with so many great people. Yes, uh, I was uh, like uh, 13 years old when I moved from my original country, Suriname in South America. To, okay. to Holland. How old were you at that time? Uh, 13 years old. 13 years old? Yeah. Okay. And when I was uh, 16 years old, I tried to do uh, kickboxing and s- playing soccer. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I was doing sport for like seven days a week. And uh, uh, one day soccer, one day uh, kickboxing, and yeah, back and forth the whole, the whole week. And okay. I did that uh, till I was. Uh, 34 years old then I stopped playing um, soccer okay. and keep going with, uh, with, with, with kickboxing why did you choose one over the other what uh, because a lot of people would say hey I could stay and make a lot more money playing soccer than than kickboxing yeah but th- th- that was my biggest part at the time when I was playing soccer and and do fighting at that time I was fighting and I get like 50 bucks <laughs> huh? right. yeah and I was playing soccer, then I had 10 grand for the season. Yep. So it was easy choice for me. Yep. Uh, I, I was keep training, but not fighting that much. Because if I was fighting on Saturday, I couldn't play on Sunday because of kickbox. Most of the time, you injure your ankle, your, your chin, or there's something. So, so I was keep training uh, uh, kickboxing, but not competing a lot. Because with soccer, I get much more money than with yep. kickboxing. So that's why I, I did it uh, in that way. But yeah. And coaching, um, I think I, I was starting when I was like uh, 27 or something like that, 28. I started to coach and uh, yeah, from there on, on, at my original gym when I, when I started, uh, Lucien Carbin, I trained there for 23 years. And then I, I left there and I started to coach uh, Alice Roleframe. So that was like in around 2007, right? 
uh, yeah, uh, I always uh, help him before with his camp uh, because we were training at the same gym. Always yep. I help him with his camp. In 2005, I went with him to the uh, Pride Grand Prix yep. in, in Japan. And uh, 2007, I really start uh, to train him and uh, do his striking. And, and from there on, uh, yeah, really a great thing. Uh, six years. Uh, Undefeated and yeah, that, K1, strike and I mean, three. I remember watching that, and it's yeah. sad because I almost that's almost kind of my last memory of a really big K1 event. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like I remember we were watching it on HD Net in yeah. the United States, and Overeem went just went on that incredible run, and then he won the heavyweight title in Dream, and then he won the heavyweight title in Strike Force, yeah. and his anticipation of getting into the UFC was at an all time high, yeah. and then he came in and beat Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Were you also a part of that fight? Yeah, yeah, Brock? I, was, I was part of that fight. So have you been involved with Alistair Overeem with every fight pretty much since he left? Because he left what, Golden Glory? Uh, yeah, uh, b before that yeah. also, you know, we were working like uh, together and he was uh, uh, twice a week he went there to, uh, to the head office of Golden Glory just to spar and during the week I was doing his striking and it went like, well, like that and uh, also, a good friend Martin De Jong was helping him with the ground game. So, uh, yeah, that's how it uh, went uh, during that period. And when he stopped at Golden Glory, uh, yeah, I still uh, uh, stayed on board. He stayed on board and uh, do yeah do this. Now, I mean, there's so many rumors around Alistair Overeem and that a lot of people claim that he's he's difficult to train with. He's changed camps a lot. I mean. There's some guys even like Boss Rutten who think that he's jumped too many camps. There's a lot of people that are very critical of Overeem's choices of how he's moved around of late. You've been with him for 10 years. What, what do you have to say about Alistair? Is he, is he easy to work with? Is, I mean, obviously this is somebody that you respect and admire. You wouldn't keep working with him, right? Uh, uh, is he easy to work with? Yeah, you know, when I, when I started with him, uh, uh, I, I live in Amsterdam, I live in, in, in Amersfoort, and yeah, well, we had an appointment like five o'clock. Uh, I have to be there in house for to train with him, and he and he, he was there, and we trained. And sometime after the training, uh, we trained like one and a half, two hour, uh, and then when I'm uh, back at my at my home, he texts me, "Oh man, coach, you killed me today." It was just, "Hey, be there at that time," we, and we just training, uh, not not complaining, and uh, yeah. I, yeah, I had a, had a good time uh, uh, with him and we, we, we still okay with, with, with each other, you know, because like now I'm here in Thailand and he was asking me to do Peter his camp and his camp a little bit uh, together, which I, I think uh, we're not going to make it because he want to be in a, in a different part of, of Thailand. So yeah, I don't know if that's going to happen, but yeah. So I mean, your 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 experience working with Overeem has always been a really good, mutually respectful, productive, yeah, professional yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Now, uh, so now you're working with Peter Hallman. Peter, you've had uh, four fights in the UFC. You're two yeah. and two, two submission wins, two tough decision losses, uh, a whole bunch of fight of the night type performances and bonuses. How's your experience so far been in the UFC, and and when did when did you two connect? Have you, Roberto, have you been involved with Peter for his four fights in the UFC? Uh, no, I, I, I met uh, Piotr, I, I, I even cannot remember, because uh, uh, Piotr told me that he, back in the days he trained a couple times uh, with me in Amsterdam, but yeah, so many guys, I yeah. can't remember. Yeah, you must just... But yeah, it was, it was like uh, two, one, uh, more than one year, one year ago, I, I met his manager uh, on an event in uh, in uh, UK. Okay. Then we were talking and uh, yeah, we just talk and nothing, uh, nothing else. And two or three months later, he, he gave me a call and he said, "Hey, I have a guy here. Uh, his name is Piotr, and yeah, he's a little bit down because uh, yeah, he's striking. He want to work on his striking. Can you uh, can you help him?" Then I told him, "Yeah, it's okay." And um, like uh, I think two or three weeks later, I went to Poland. Trained with him for three weeks and um, yeah, it was on. Okay. And from that moment, we had uh, two fights together. Uh, first, uh, Eves Edwards. Okay. <coughs> which he won by submission, and uh, his last fight uh, against uh, yeah, Lazen Tibau. Put put on a good fight, and uh, yeah, so he's doing well. And he, yeah, you can see that since 
since that uh, since that we saw that he improved and do a lot of more things and, uh, on with this striking also. So uh, we are on a good way. Well, it's funny because Peter, you're saying that, uh, or that you, Roberto, you were saying that his your manager Peter came to Roberto wanting to to make your striking better. Um, but I mean, you do have seven knockouts, seven submissions. You're obviously a very well-rounded fighter. What are some of the perhaps the holes in your game, or what are some of the areas of improvement that you're trying to get out of working with Roberto? Yeah, like going to the UFC for me, it was like going to deep water. I was just training in in my home city in one club, you know. So like I my first fight was I don't have much time to prepare like like I think month or, or maybe one and a half months. Something. So you got the offer, the call to yeah, have yeah, a UFC fight in a month. And, yeah, of course you don't refuse. Yeah, I was want I, I wanted to go there for like oh for a long time. Yeah. And then then I win my first fight and then uh, like, like maybe two weeks after they they call me to to get second fight it was also short notice and yeah also I, I took that fight and and I lose and and I I, I see whole I see that I, I have to improve that yeah to to stay on the division and they they could could put you in against anybody and uh, that was against uh, Ally and Quinton, Quinton too right? yeah, yeah. and he's you know he's he's put on some incredible performances of yeah. late so I don't think there's any shame in uh, yeah in yeah but, but, I, but well. I, it was like, like going into the deep water you know and yeah. I see if you want to stay there you have to improve. And, and I saw in in my hometown it will be tough, you know. And then and then I was thinking where I can go, and because, because I am in the army at that time I could not leave. And yeah, yeah my manager told me yeah, that, that there is one guy. It's possible to work with him. He gave me his Skype. We talk. Yeah, and then he came to Poland. And those three weeks we stay first at Poland were really impressed me and I see how much potential the coach have and how, how how far I can go with him and so for me it was easy choice to like to, to continue. Excellent. Now you're also a second lieutenant in the Polish Navy, is that correct? Uh, in the I mean, army right now. In the army, yeah. okay. So are you still juggling then both jobs? I mean you're, you're a yeah, but they like still, they, in, they, they in the support the army? me and yeah, I have a lot of support and that I can go for, do my camps and yeah. <coughs> now, would you like to be able to c compete solely in the UFC? Would you like to be able to just fight full time, or did you actually want to yeah, continue both careers? Yeah, pretty much do it. It's not like like I mean, army make me any problem with that. So yeah, of course, yeah, UFC is my passion, and yeah, I have just one life, and it's what I want to do. Because I mean, that must be a an interesting balance. Uh, I mean. It, Roberto, I'm sure in your, you know, in your history with the amount of people you've worked with, I'm sure you've worked with a lot of full-time fighters. I mean, just the big stars you've worked with, obviously they get to train full-time. But I'm sure you've also dealt with a lot of people like Peter who have had to, either had to or want to keep two jobs. How do you find that's impacted people's ability to improve and to, and to really, you know, succeed in fighting? Um. Yeah, you know the the, the only difference in, in this is uh, because he is he, from Poland. I'm, I live now in Amsterdam, so we have to move like uh, back and forward. To, to how do you guys manage that? I mean, uh, how much time do you guys get to spend working together in, over the course of a year? Uh, no, I think. Uh, or in Amsterdam. The, 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 <laughs> yeah, Amsterdam is cool, and yeah, I buy my scooter there, so. Yeah. So you actually you you prefer to go travel to Amsterdam in terms of Roberto yeah, there? Yeah, it's easier because yeah, Roberto have also his family, you know, and yeah, it's uh, easier for me to move than for him to, to okay. move to Poland. Yeah, but sometimes he he go to Poland and we also have good times there. And before the camp, we have to travel somewhere anyway. We just then when the fight is there because we because of we have like big big delay with my fight yeah so then we stay more in Amsterdam but like before fight with us choose what, what that this time is better for us just okay. considering so when fight. you're in Amsterdam where do you guys train in what facility oh I, uh, I have a gym there in uh, Amsterdam called gym 3 and there uh, and there is where we go uh, we, we train and also I have a, a friend who have a gym in also in Holland we go spar there and yeah and one of my fighters is also the uh, glory uh, lightweight uh, tournament champion 2013. So it's a good sparring partner. Who's that? 
Andy Risty. Okay. Yeah, the machine. All right. So, uh, yeah, so there's always... Uh, yeah, I'm sure with the yeah. amount of time and people you've worked with there, there's no shortage of places for you to, yeah. to, to train, right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, now, do you handle exclusively his striking? Who do you bring in for the wrestling, the jiu-jitsu? It, it depends on uh, what we need uh, for, for a fight. <clears throat> but I, I do is uh, striking, but uh, yeah, because of uh, my experience, I also have my view about uh, yeah, uh, ground things and to, how to avoid that or, or, or how to attack. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. so how does your striking training play into the ground game? I mean, do you also incorporate some, some you know, defensive elements of to not being taken down? Or what what, what, what yeah, aspect yeah. of you that know, do you incorporate? You, uh, as a striking coach, you cannot... Uh, because my background is, 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 is uh, kickboxing, so yeah. you cannot go with that in the MMA just like yeah, kickboxing because MMA is different different range. Yep. Huh? So you have to when you do your your, your, your your drills, you have to do it based on that uh, um, distance, you know. Yeah. So that's that's how I work. Yeah. Yeah. When I had a, when I had James McSweeney on the show, we had a, an interesting conversation where you know I asked him to explain you know why why is Dutch style Muay Thai so effective in mixed martial arts? What's your answer to a question like that? Like what what makes Dutch style Muay Thai so effective in MMA? Dutch Dutch Muay Thai is uh, effective because of if you look at these these Thai guys, they if you look what they're doing on the pads and then bam bam doing this and blah 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 and uh, but in the MMA you cannot do that. Huh? If you do that, they take you down, and they yeah. So you ha you also have to have that feel of a if I, after I do that, I have to move there, or I have to do it from a different position, and that's that's how you how you do it. And with, with uh, Dutch kickboxing, it's not like four, five, six combination. Most of the time, it's just like hardcore boom, hook, uh, low kick, move away, straight, uh, body shot, huh? like that. Yeah. And not, not all that crazy thing what the, the Thai guy are doing here in the midst. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as martial arts fans, it's funny because people they'll watch movies, they'll watch action shows, yeah. etc., and they'll you know they'll see like action stars doing incredible moves, and people are like, hey, how come we don't see these moves in in uh, in MMA? Yeah. Every now and then, you will see Anthony Pettis do something crazy, bouncing yeah, yeah, off the, yeah. the cage or you know going off of a hand. But I mean, it sounds really like Dutch style MMA really incorporates some some simple yet highly effective either solo or a low count combinations yeah. and that you're really aware of how you're repositioning in yourself yeah. as you come back from those strikes so yeah. that you're not being taken down yeah. or taken advantage of. Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so tell us, uh, Peter, your, your next opponent is Magomed Mustafaev. Is that yeah. how you pronounce his name? Magomed Musta Mustafaev. Maybe that's better. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a Russian guy, right? Yeah. Okay, what do you know about Magomed? Yeah, I watched some of his fights and yeah, I think he will be a tough fighter and it will be tough test. I cannot underestimate because he's newcomer, he's hungry to win, of course, and I think it will be a good fight. Did he, you have a? Did you have the what we call the UFC jitters the first time you win the octagon? You know, everybody says that there's there's a certain fear that's exclusive to the UFC. It's the big stage, it's the bright lights, it's what every fighter dreams of getting into. How was your first experience when you walked into the into Yeah, the I was I was happy to, to be there. Mo, 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 mo. The, 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 the main feeling was like I was happy to be there. And uh, yeah, on the other hand, there was like all crowd against me because I fight Brazilian guy in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, but during the fight, you don't think about this. Yeah. So, I mean, this is interesting because you guys are going to be somewhat on neutral ground. You guys are going to be fighting in Berlin, Germany. You're Polish. He's Russian. It's his UFC debut. You've been out for a while. What do you think is going to happen? How, yeah, you, how, you, how, you, how are you approaching this fight? Because you're a, you've got a lot of first round finishes. Yeah. You've got a lot of stoppages. He's got nothing but eleven wins by stoppage as well. He's eleven and one. So I mean, it looks like you're both quick starters, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to be uh, feeling each other out much in the first round. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think of course I believe I win, but I don't ask to, uh, estimate my opponent. So. I mean, getting off quickly in the first round. No, no, is that I, I don't that think you... uh, even about finish. When it's finishes there, then I, I go for it. Or when I, yeah. But I don't think like I have to finish this guy in this round. Or I, I just do what I have to do. Yeah, when the opportunity presents itself, yeah, you finish him, to... and it's happened eight times in the first round. Yeah, and 15 minutes is a lot of time to, to yeah. like fight. 
<laughs> so why did you guys come specifically to Phuket and to Tiger Muay Thai? Oh, uh, why? Uh, yeah, you know, I uh, I know James McSweeney for yeah, I think almost 18 years now. Okay, so you and James go way back. We, yeah, we were training at the same gym, same coaches, and uh, uh, we didn't see each other for a while. But since uh, I think uh, two years. Um, we start to talk each other again. We met each other because I was also in the U.S. You know, for for one and a half year. And then he already asked me a couple of time, uh, yeah, maybe to help him with his fight or come to Vegas. And uh, but I, I didn't make it. And uh, finally, I told him. Uh, he told me he's here in Phuket uh, training at his gym. And I told him hey, maybe it's a good idea to to come over and see how it's. Uh, how it's over there, and maybe we can do Piotr this camp there, and so that's why. So, how's your experience been at Tiger? What do you guys think about Tiger Muay Thai? Yeah, it's it's good. A lot, a lot of guys, and uh, it's, it's a big gym, and okay. uh, yeah, stay there is good. Food is good, and uh, yeah, training is good. Yeah. So, have you just been training together? Have you guys been using the other trainers there, James, no, Roger? No, no, we just we just train, train together, and okay. uh, like. Uh, James is not in now, so I do the, the striking class for, for him. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right, because James, uh, he yeah. went to corner one of his fighters in Dubai. Uh, James went to corner yeah, yeah. one of his fighters, okay. yeah, so... Oh, great, so you're, you're, then you're giving, you're giving private classes, or you're giving his group classes? Group classes, group classes. So, okay. so I have him around with, with that, and um, uh, he just signed with, uh, with a promotion in, in Dubai, GFC. GFC, so, yeah. So uh, I will help him for, for his, uh, when they announce his fight, I'm going to help him also with the preparation for his fight. So. Okay. So have you cornered James McSweeney many times? Uh, or trained him? Not, not in the past, but we're not going to do it. Oh, we always help each other during the okay. time that I was fighting. He was fighting. At that time, he was like 70, 70 years, 18 years old. Boy, kick his ass in the gym. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now... Uh, yeah, but I I, I gonna I gonna help him. He asked me to to help him with uh, when they give him a, give him a fight. So I gonna I gonna call him. Now you mentioned uh, before this you spent a year and a half in the United States. Yeah. Where were you working when you were there? Uh, I work at a striking coach at the Black Sillians with uh, all okay. these guys, Rashad, um, Vito, Alistair, all, all these uh, guys. There. Yeah, I yeah. Got, I called Rashad for his fight uh, against uh, Dan Anderson. Okay. Together with Kenny Monday and uh, yeah. Was, was what do you what do you think of the Black Zillions? Uh My experience there uh, with the Black Zillions, uh, the, the 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 fighters are are okay, you know. But uh, um, between the coaches, it's not what it is. Uh, that's my experience. Yeah. So what do you mean? You felt that there's some? It's not. What's the problem with the coaches? Um, for me, it uh, doesn't matter where I go, which team or whatever. Uh, for me, it's uh, like teamwork. Eh? Yeah. You know, and um, if people are gonna look like this, oh, you come here to steal my job or whatever, so you, you, you there cannot be a connection. Eh? So did you feel and like you had a hard time blending into the group? Uh, yeah, and, sure. and especially with, 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 a, with a few guys. When I came there, because eventually Rashad is a guy that saw me when I was there with uh, Alistair's camp uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for his fight uh, against uh, Bigfoot Silva. Bigfoot yep. Silva? Yep. No, no, it was uh, uh, Junior De Santos, but that fight cancelled. And then Rochard saw me moving with Alistair and then he went to the, the, the big boss and he said, I want this guy to come over here. I want to move like him, I want to fight like him. So, so Rashad saw you training with Alistair, he was yeah. impressed by what he saw and then yeah. he wanted to work with you. Okay. Yeah, so I went there, you know, and uh, when I started, I came there, then I was already a striking coach there. There was uh, Harry Hoof, he was at half a year or uh, a little bit more before me, he was there. So uh, I came there and all the guys <laughs> want to train with me, with they you. come, hey, can, can we train, can we train? And, he started to make this, all these stupid uh, rules. They at first have to go to him to ask to train with me, and yep. I did, 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 did the silly thing. So, uh, 
So no, no time for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not easy. I think uh, in this sport, as I'm, sh you guys are both aware of, I'm sure there's a lot of big egos. There's a lot of people that are worried about their job security and worried about yeah, the way things are being perceived. And I, you just sound like the type of guy you just want to go in and help guys. Yeah, fight you, especially your, your <laughs> team. And uh, you know, it, it cannot be like that. You, you, you went away with a fighter. Yeah. Uh, like a, a guy like Rochard, you went, to, I went away with him for his fight uh, against Dan Henderson yep. and you come back uh, the next Monday on the on the training and then not even hey, uh, great nice that you hey, won the fight no not even that you say like oh you're wow. back you're back a little bit strange no, no congratulations <laughs> yeah, no nothing you just beat one of the best guys in the world yeah but, <laughs> so, yeah. but wow stupid okay so besides the black zillions did you train anywhere else there or help try you know coach anywhere else uh, no, no, I was just there at the Black Seals, trained train there and uh, trained the, the fighters and um, yeah, after I, I left, come back to, to Holland and um, we did two of his camp at the, uh, the lab in Arizona. Okay. It was okay, John right. Cross, John Cross, nice guys and the, that that's more like a family, a lot of uh, fighters in pure uh, weight class, so, so it, was, it was nice nice to be there. I think last year we spent like maybe I think five months uh, yeah. in Arizona, okay. <laughs> like that. So, so it's pretty much. So, Peter, when you fight, what what affiliation do you claim? Like, what's what's your fight team? So you know, you know, is 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 yeah, that yeah, exactly? yeah, yeah, just, just, like me. just me? Yeah. So, is there is there anybody else in this team? No, it's just me. Just two men, the two man army. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. No destruction, you know what we were talking about. Okay. And, uh, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, it's uh, it's cool how you guys just move in a pair and uh, you're doing your thing and, and training in different spots in different places. It's That's quite a different setup than a lot of these other guys have who are just positioned in a camp. They've got their guys, they train, they bring, bring a few guys like yourselves from yeah. the outside. You know, but it sounds like you guys are almost like... Uh, MMA nomads, you know, <laughs> kind of just going wherever, uh, you know, Holland, Phuket, yeah. Amsterdam, yeah. Uh, Poland. Yeah, but Do you guys that, like that? Do you like that? Yeah, that, but that, that also makes it special, you know, you, you have a, um, a few in different different teams and uh, uh, they're training with different people, you know, different environments. So, uh, yeah, that's okay. Is this kind of the first time that you've operated in this capacity? Because it sounds like you've, you know, if when you were in Holland, you were in the gym and you had the guys in there, bam, they had that team. If you're in the Black Zillions, you were like almost like a guest coach there, if you will, training all those guys. And here it just it seems like you've really just put things down to the essence and you're here working working with one fighter. Yeah, but with Alistair, it was also like that, you know, yeah, yeah. because we also did two, mm -hmm. two or three camps here in Thailand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I guess that yeah. working with Overeem, that almost gave you the blueprint of how you're now working with Piotr. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, if anybody wants to work with you, Roberto, how do they get? How do they? How can they work with you? People that want to work with me, just go on my website www.robertoflamingo.com. Yep. And yeah, contact me. And All right. Then, uh, it's as easy as that. Just yeah. reach out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then we can arrange something. Yeah. Okay. Or a seminar, or private, or whatever. Just contact me. Peter, anyone you want to shout out? Any other, do you do, you do any coaching? Do you, do you have any other services besides obviously serving your country yeah, and uh, kicking ass in the cage? Yeah. <laughs> I do from time to time. I do a seminar in Poland. The okay. people here contact me on my Facebook, so yeah. So you do like MMA-based seminars? Yeah, MMA-based okay. seminar. All right. Do you work with any other Polish fighters as well? Yeah, I have, I have many friends in Poland that also fight some of them. In Bellator, in, in in other Polish organization, but but yeah, mostly we are moving with Roberto. So okay. yeah, that was pretty cool to see that a couple weekends ago that we had that uh, that UFC in, in Krakow. Yeah, did you guys watch cool. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was actually pretty good. Yeah, it was yeah, pretty yeah. Good. You know, it was it was it was low on star power, but uh, you know, I think a lot of people came to fight on that card. Uh, there was there was some there was some good scraps. You know, and it's just part of this growth of the UFC. Every, if they're going to put an event on every week, they gotta they gotta find new places yeah, and new, new places. talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have those cards, and I think every single time you might not you know you might not expect much out of the event, but there's always one or two people that come in and really shine on those on those European cards. You know? Yeah, but you know the. Uh, people excited when they, especially people like in the fight uh, business they're excited when the UFC is coming over here and uh, the same to Holland people cannot wait till the UFC is going to be in Holland so. yeah you know I mean for us like you know I'm, I'm Canadian and I lived for seven years in the, in the United States so 
we're, we're so used to having the UFC and these big shows put on, and, and we take it for granted. And I yeah. think, and then when we see these smaller cards that they're putting on right now, we kind of feel like, oh, who's this, who's this, I don't know anybody. You, you, you look at the card on Wikipedia, ah, three quarters of the fighters don't even have a Wikipedia entry, and you're like, yeah. how are they getting a shot in the UFC? It's just like, but guys, this is what has to be done. To, you know, There's a huge generation of yeah. awesome star fighters that are all injured, retired yeah. or just unable to compete any further and yeah. you got to find new people and give yeah. them lots of opportunities to compete a bunch and yeah. create a UFC record yeah. because it's the the record that they have before that no one cares about no you yeah. know <coughs> so it's it's the I think the UFC is in a difficult position where they need this growth and there's going to be this decline in star power and it's going to be slow to ramp it up but they have to start somewhere yeah, and, yeah, and I yeah. think this year is really that year where the UFC is making a huge emphasis of being like we got to get into every country in the world that has good martial artists and put on a show yeah you know? otherwise they're not going to get new uh, yep. new guys in, in the UFC so they, they give even uh, their record people their record is not like that they give guys a chance to come and join the UFC and uh, yeah it's uh, important when you get a, get a chance that you put on a good show. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Roberto, it's an honor. I know yeah. you've worked with so many incredible people. Yeah. Continue to keep up the great job. Keep uh, teaching people how to whoop ass. <laughs> Peter, best of luck on June 20th in your fifth UFC fight. I hope that goes your way. Uh, this was the Trash Talk MMA podcast, guys. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, with my guest, striking legend, Roberto Flamingo, and UFC lightweight contender, Piotr Hallman. Peace. I don't want to hear it. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. What upset shit? Yeah. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. On my face, behind my back, I talk trash. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter. Yeah. At Trash Talk MMA. That's what you said. Let us know you're listening. Who the fuck said shit? Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA.